Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Irene Moncada, an Events Commissioner here at Unicom Seminars. We are pleased to be hosting a webinar titled Creating a Culture of Successful Agile Teams. The webinar is presented by Paul Field, who is the Director of Clarity of Purpose and works with IT managers who realize there is something missing in their Agile implementation. Paul is also speaking at our event next week, the Agile Program and Project Management Conference. You can go to the Unicorn Conference page and uh, um, check out the event uh, on, our, um, on the Agile Conference uh, pages. And at this point, I would like to hand over to Paul Field. Um, there will be opportunities for your questions and answers at the end of Paul Field presentation. We hope you enjoy the webinar and welcome, and welcome your feedback. Over to you, Paul. Cool. Thanks, Larry. Well, hello. I'm Paul Field. And the first thing I need to say is I'm recovering from a cold at the moment, so I might be a little bit bunged up and I might cough during this, so I hope you'll forgive me if that happens. Um, and I want to talk today about Agile teams and cultures of successful Agile teams. And I'm very interested in teams because earlier in my career, I led a genuinely high-performing team. We produced extremely high quality software. It was about 10 times faster than anything anyone had seen at the time. Our clients and our business loved it. We were seen as genuine partners in the business. We were suggesting innovations in their business model. It was enormous fun. Uh, it lasted about seven years, that team and some other teams that we span off of it. And how you really know it was high performing is that the team, the management, and the stakeholders still talk about how great that team was five years later. Now my passion is to make a personal difference to people and I hope you're going to take something away from this talk or maybe we have a chance to work together and it means that your work life is a bit easier, a bit more interesting, a bit more motivating. I'd really love it if I can help you create something that you'd want to talk about proudly five years later. So we're going to look at what makes teams successful, and in the process, we're going to answer a rather interesting question, I think, which is, what is the role of a manager in Agile? At the extreme end, you sometimes hear Agile people saying they don't need managers, or they don't need project managers, and that's nonsense, and we're going to see what managers can do to create and support amazing teams. Agile is really trying to create high-performing teams. So what is a high-performing team? Why do they matter to the business? And, and how do we create them? So high-performing teams have quite a few qualities, and this is just a few. Complementary talents and skills, a strong sense of accountability for their goals. They have higher levels of collaboration and innovation. They have robust methods of resolving conflict. They have clear focus and intense energy and high levels of mutual trust. And this makes a difference to the business. So high-performing teams is a concept that comes before Agile. And some of the companies that first implemented them, like Procter & Gamble, were reporting 30 to 40% higher productivity. And Shenandoah Life were saying they were processing 50% more client applications and customer service requests. And this was with less people. And it's not just about productivity. My experience of high-performing teams is a really high-quality product and solutions that are much better for the user's needs. And Agile is promising this, uh, but equally I've seen teams that are doing Agile, but they seem really demotivated. They're stressed. They're regarded badly by stakeholders. And there's some industry data like the Chaos Report that's suggesting like 57% of Agile projects are over budget or time, or they're not completed. And you'd think that was shocking, except that Waterfall is actually worse than that. So it was really something we should be doing or could do here to make projects and teams a lot better. As I say, high-performing teams isn't a new concept. Uh, to prepare for this, I was reading some old papers that come from even 25 years ago, which is before Agile, and they talk about the same kind of problems that we see with Agile teams, and they have techniques for solving them. So let, let's have a look at what we can do. Now, I've developed just a really simple model that would, can help you to focus attention on different aspects of a team 
and that means that you can manage and support them better. So we just have a very quick look at the simple model. It starts with a team, and despite what you might hear from some Agile people, the team does need management support. You can think of management support as coming in two forms. There's direct support, so in a role as a line manager or a project manager, you work directly with that team and probably you know, know the people in it. And there's organizational support. So this is the kind of support that would come at a second or third level of management and is more like how you support teams across the entire organization. When you're looking at the team itself, there's three things to pay, or you can pay attention to. There's what's happening inside the team, there's what's happening outside the team, and there's what's happening at the boundary between the two. And that's the simple model, and we're just going to use this to look at failure modes of teams, things that can go wrong, and what you can do about them. And the model just helps you to pay attention to different things around the team. Now, the context for the rest of what I'm going to talk about, um, my experience uh, before I started running my own company, which I do now, was working in large enterprises. So it's things like 90,000 person organization, and that comes with politics, functional silos, some command and control culture. And a lot of what I'm talking about is to help you be able to set up successful teams when those are some of your challenges. If you're a 10 person startup, this is going to apply a bit differently. Things like the boundary of your team is actually the boundary of your company. So you should be able to take still a lot from this, but it'll be a little bit different. And when you grow to a 100 person company, you'll, you'll start to hit some of these larger scale problems. So let's get practical. Let's look at failure modes and what you can do about them. And we'll start with things that uh, go wrong and you can do more at this organizational level. So the first thing is it's actually about the boundaries. It's what is the boundary of a team. So one failure mode is you assign people to multiple teams. And now an individual doesn't know what they're accountable for. They have really hard prioritization decisions because they're, they're personal ones about what they're supposed to do. And they don't know whether the other team members have higher priorities, so they can't rely on them and trust them. Another failure mode here is sizing. One person on their own isn't a team. A hundred person could arguably be a team, but actually you have to structure it as smaller teams. And the third thing is sometimes managers form teams simply by declaring a set of people is a team and that they should just behave accordingly. And often those people are just people who report to the same manager. And you just can't create real teams that way. I've seen it done time and time again, but it doesn't work. Instead, you must take explicit action to establish the team's boundaries. You define the goals the members are collectively responsible for, and you give them some accountability to manage their own processes and their relations with external entities, such as the clients and co-workers. So what I've seen work, and these are things you might do as a manager directly, but these are the things that are good to have organizational um, policy around. The first thing is just to ensure teams are real teams. If you look at Scrum, it says a team is three to nine people, and it has all the competencies required to accomplish their work. And that's actually quite a standard kind of definition that will come from other team literature as well. Other things that make a difference to teams are making people 100% allocated to the team, which means they may have some other non-essential things they do, but when push comes to shove, it's the team, it's their teammates, it's the purpose of their team that matters. And I know a really great program manager who I learned a load from. He went around every person in his 100 plus program, 100 plus person program, and he made sure that their sole priority was his program. In other words, he managed the boundary. It was one of the best pieces of boundary management around a program that I've, I've seen. And it, and it sounds like quite a simple thing to do. It's a lot of effort at that scale, of course. And another thing is that's talked about a lot with Agile is co-location. So if you can co-locate a team, um, it's, it just makes life easier. It's perfectly possible to have a good, uh, high-performing, distributed team. It's just harder. So it's an, I think it's an organizational decision to do this. 
because you've either got a, an organizational level say we're going to co-locate teams as much as we can and structure your organization to support that or you say we're going to support distribution in which case you need um, really good collaboration technology, you need more team coaching to actually help the teams to gel and you need at least some travel involved and you have to make that decision. So once you've got real teams, then encourage the team performance. So reward teams as a team. Most large organizations have got individual performance appraisal systems. Uh, when I was doing this kind of thing with a large organization, I was quite surprised because I thought this would be a big blocker. But when I talked to departmental managers, they said, oh, no, it's not a problem. We could look at team performance and then we'll allocate it equally to all the individuals. So we'll just map it onto the individual performance appraisal system. Um, so this is not necessarily as hard as you might think in a, a large organization. And the final thing that's worth doing at an organizational level is it's not just the forming, it's what you, you do when you break teams up. And a lot of the time it, it's done at a project boundary. So we finish the project, we disband the team. But a team's like a social group. It takes time and effort for them to bond. It takes to go through a sort of forming, norming, storming, performing kind of process. And a lot of teams don't get there. So if you can get the high performing teams that we're talking about and they've gone through that process, they're like your golden teams. They're, they're probably outperforming everyone else. So keep them together. Keep them together and bring the work to them. And that's an organizational policy to do that. So we'll now look a little bit more about, um, oh, sorry, providing resources. That's the other thing. Uh, teams need things. They need tools and equipment and training. They may need space. They may need people. And how responsive are you when a team says that it needs something? This, this applies at a direct support level, but also at the organizational level. So let's look at now some failure modes around the direct support. So if you are the manager, what can, can go wrong here? Um, and the first one is, it's kind of micromanagement. It's managing each individual as an individual. Things like assigning tasks to individuals, tracking progress with individuals. And Doing this is usually really demotivating for staff. It's actually really stressful as a manager. There is so much pressure and organization to do if, if you do this. And it's a boundary problem because there, is no, there isn't a boundary around the team. Um, there's another extreme with management as well, which is the manager who says, oh, they're a team. Agile talks about self-organizing teams. So self-organizing. They don't really need me, I'll go and do something else. And of course, frustrating for the team because they don't get support and frustrating actually for the manager in the long term because the team doesn't self-organize and it doesn't deliver. So what I've found works really for the direct support is to sh shift your mind that you're now managing the team as a whole entity and not the individuals. And there's a number of points to this. First one you can do is you set or help set the direction and purpose of the team. Why, why did this team get set up in the organization? Why are we paying for it? Help them understand that. And I find in Agile, there's some people who are scared to do this. That we talk a lot about servant leadership uh, and they seem to be a bit scared of setting a direction or giving a vision. But actually what we've tended to find is that Although well, servant leadership has got a lot of really good qualities, if you combine it with things like transformational leadership, where you have a, more of a vision, uh, you can get something that's called catalytic leadership. And people who, who act like that do very well at managing teams. So, so don't be afraid with a bit of direction and purpose. And, and it can be discussed, it can be created with the team. The second thing is, if the team can't see a problem, then you point it out and then try and coach the whole team to solve it themselves. You're almost trying to train them to understand their own problems and fix it for themselves. And when I say can't see, this isn't nagging about detailed issues. This is a strategic thing. This is about kind of unknown unknowns, things that the team is just not at all aware that there could be a problem about. And you bring it to their awareness and then help them to deal with it. And we're going to look at a lot of areas you may see them and you could draw attention 
the team's attention to them as we go. We have your authority. Usually as a manager, you've got authority beyond the team, and you can use that to solve problems that are outside the team's influence or scope. Uh, and the important thing here is to do that fast and effectively so that the team feel you're supporting them. I think the final thing that's important in direct support is just helping them to learn to safely learn from failures. They're, they're going to fall flat on their face at some point, and if you can help help them pick themselves up and help them to, to genuinely learn something and make an active difference to how they operate, um, and actually help them celebrate their successes as well. I didn't put that on the slide, but that's really important too. And you're thinking here of the whole team, whole team more than individuals. And when you do this, you stop being seen really as a manager and you're seen much more as a leader, a leader with direction. You're seen as strategic and the team see you as empowering and supportive. What we're going to look at in the rest of the presentation is about really directly supporting teams. It's really the second point in particular about if they can't see a problem, you help them coach it. Well, what kind of problems? What what might we be able to see with our more strategic view that the team might be missing because they're they're stuck in the detail. So just to remind you, here's our simple model again. We've been talking about organizational support and direct support. So now we're going to look at the team, at the inside, at the outside, at the boundary. What kind of things can go wrong? What can you do? What do really good teams look like? So we'll start with outside the team. And here are some failure modes that could happen. We've got the team, and typically here most of the problem is the team is looking inside to itself. It's not reaching out. So outside, we've got some stakeholders who are disappointed. You know, they're trying to make do something for the business, probably make money, and what's been delivered just isn't fit for purpose. Or possibly even worse is the stakeholders don't even know what the team is doing. You can have you might hear conversations in your organisation where someone's asking, well, well, when will this be done? And you get an answer like, we can't tell you we're agile, um, which surprises me, but I've got this from three or four different project managers in different organizations who tell me this is a standard problem with their agile teams. And I think there's usually some deeper dysfunctions in the organization around estimation when this happens. But fundamentally, agile teams have historical metrics and they can forecast. And certainly my teams would have been able to give you reasonably accurate estimates about when things would be done. Uh, I think Agile should be much better at it than other methods. So other things that can go wrong, um, Scrum talks about having potentially shippable increments. And I've seen teams that, that do sprint and sprint and sprint, but don't actually ever ship anything. And that's a problem um, with the outside, because you're never putting what you develop out to find out if it, if it works, what the process for going out is, what the stakeholders think, what the feedback is. And the final thing is we have a lot of good discussion about your know, voice of the customer and doing what's right for our business. But in large organizations, there's a lot of stakeholders. And there might be someone over in the corner here saying, well, why aren't they following the security standard? So with these kind of failure modes, you're disappointing stakeholders of various kinds. They, they end up not liking the team, there's frustrations, there's pressure, uh, and in the end, particularly from the business stakeholders, they're not happy, you'll be perceived as failing. So what can you do to manage the outside? Well, first of all, this is a very a kind of simplistic landscape of what kind of things there are. So we've got stakeholders. I like to break them into two categories. There's the ones that are your customers, your clients, and also the business functions and units that um, support your customers and clients. So we normally call them the business. In that, there's a sense of the business value that the organization is getting. Usually, you know, you're making money or protecting money. Uh, you're trying to reduce costs or you're trying to avoid costs. And it's the making money that usually...
needs and they all have things that are valuable to them. So if you think of that as a map of the kind of general categories of things that are outside, when you're helping the team from this point of view, one thing you can do is help them understand that full context. So help them understand there are lots of stakeholders, not just the customer or the business, not one. There's audit, security, regulators, there's other teams. Yeah, even in your startup, there'll be you know, governments and regulations and things that you, data protection even. And there's lots of just good old fashioned stakeholder analysis tools that project managers know and just you know, dig them out. They don't take long to do. Um, but it will just open the eyes of everyone in the team to what their, their real context is. The second thing is, is this vision setting, it's this purpose. So help the team have an engaging, meaningful direction. I usually do this through two things, which is business value. How does the work of the team contribute to the business success? And through stakeholder value. So what is the team enabling the stakeholders to do better? And particularly, can you quantify that better and ideally measure it? So those two things really kind of give a purpose that's really aligned to all One of my early agile teams, we, we took over from a failed project. So we walked in to talk to the business and they'd had a year of 30 odd developers uh, looking at project status reports but never actually getting anything delivered and certainly not what they wanted. And they just, they hated IT. So, so when we turned up, it, you know, there was a look of, oh, another bunch of jokers, you know, and very demoralized. But what we did, we turned up every week and we said, well, what are we going to do in the next week? And then when we returned, we'd done what we said we were going to do. And it was something real, initially on a UAT system. And they tried it. They used real software. They told us what they thought. And then we said, okay, well, next week we would have done this. And we kept doing that. And about, I don't know, a month, six weeks in, suddenly the business were really excited. And suddenly they trusted us because we we did what we said we were going to do and they saw the real software growing in front of them and, and they felt much more in control and that it was going to go somewhere. And I, I think this point, making commitments, commitments that your stakeholders care about and doing it on a very regular basis, at least monthly, we did it weekly, um, because then occasionally you can fail and it's kind of okay because you've got enough trust and on a weekly basis, you genuinely, generally know what you're capable of doing in a week, but you might not in a year. And for me, this is the cornerstone of Agile governance. This is the other side of the bargain. If we're talking about setting up teams and we give them autonomy and we give them lots of support, we're giving them all this, what are they giving us and the business? Well, it's results. And that's where the commitment comes in. And as a manager, what you're doing is helping to hold the team accountable. And accountable isn't a stick. It's just asking people to see whether they can do something. If they can, you celebrate the success, and if you don't, then try and learn from it and take some positive action to improve. You know, failure shouldn't be punishment, failure should be learning. That's a key thing as a manager. And when you get this right, and people are making commitments and meeting them, what you've got is a constant stream of small successes. It's success, 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 success. And the stakeholders are feeling success, 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 um, which is brilliant for everyone involved. So when it's working well, it looks a bit like this. You hear your teams talking in terms of more like business and stakeholder value, like you can make trades 10% faster, not so much in terms of features. You're hearing your stakeholders talk about, they always do what they promise, they meet their commitments. I, you're talking about things like trust. You, the business know it's improving month on month because of what the team is doing. It's not a feature delivery, the business is better. And the team 
eventually start to step up and become more partners. They think of better ways, simpler, cheaper ways to do what it is the business really wants. We've got the team kind of reaching out proactively to other stakeholders. I've certainly discovered that if you go and have an early conversation with security or audit, they're usually very pleased that you've actually reached out to them because no one ever does. And you'll have a very constructive conversation where you can learn what you need to be successful, what other things you're going to have to do to satisfy them, satisfy your security audit requirements. Uh, it, the relationship's great, uh, your project goes a lot better, you don't get un your horrible surprises near the end. When it's like this, that there's a lot of credit going round, credit gets multiplied. If the business is doing well, the team's perceived as doing well, and of course the manager is perceived as doing very well. Uh, and the feelings there, yeah, there's a lot of trust and respect and partnership going on. That's what you're aiming for. So we've looked at what happens if we focus on the outside, what can go wrong, what we can do about it. So now we'll have a quick look at the boundary itself. So failure modes in the boundary, um, really common one is this, multiple stakeholders and they're all shouting, do this for me, do this for me. And the team can fall into a pattern as well of just tell us what to do. And this is, this is called order taking, just tell me a feature, I'll write it, tell me the next one, I'll write it. There's kind of not a lot of necessarily thinking going on with respect to the business. The, the really subtle thing that's often going on here is there's a senior stakeholder who isn't getting what they want. Why is no one implementing my business strategy? Quite a common pattern I've seen several times is the senior guy delegates the strategy to the junior guys in the business. The junior guys tell the team, do this, do this, do this, but actually they've got their own agendas. Uh, or they've misunderstood the strategy. Six months, a year later, the senior person actually takes a look and is really disappointed with what's happening. And that's frustrating for the, the senior stakeholders, it's frustrating for the team, and ultimately it, it's a failure because that senior stakeholder isn't happy. So have a look at managing this. But I'm just uh, going to take a very slight tangent to talk about what Scrum says. So. I always really enjoy learning new things. I've been doing Agile for 14 years. I've read the Scrum Guide numerous times. And in preparing for this talk, I discovered a little nuance that I'd never picked up on before. So in the Scrum Guide, it says the Scrum team consists of a product owner, the development team, and the Scrum Master. And the nuance I hadn't spotted is there's two teams. It says development team, and it says Scrum team. I thought that's really interesting. And then I realized what they've actually done is really clever. The Scrum Master and the product owner are responsible for the boundary. So they've created a team, so in our simple model, the development team is the inside, and they've given two people responsibility for managing the boundary. The product owner is responsible for what, and the Scrum Master is responsible for how. The product owner looks after what the team's doing and the product, and hopefully all those stakeholders. And the Scrum Master is more the, the how, but also is the interface with management. And we'll see that in a moment. So what I've seen work around managing the boundary and um, those kind of failure modes. So if you're a manager, what you can do, first one is help the team hold a firm boundary with the stakeholders. So it's standard practice. You've got all requests for work going through one backlog and the product owner is one person who prioritizes. So it's one place, one person. That's how the decisions are done. And there can be a lot of moaning and attempting to get around that. So help help the team stand firm because that's that's the key to your firm boundary. When you've got the senior stakeholder problem, something I found very useful is to encourage the product owner to actually make the decision making criteria clear. Um, it could be that the decision-making criteria is the senior guy, looks through the list and decides. Um, things I've seen work really well is doing a kind of cost-benefit um, of the requests that are coming in. And there's a number of reasons that works really, really well, particularly if you've established what the business benefits and the stakeholder value are. I, it's one of my focus areas when I work with product owners is teaching them how to do that just because of the fantastic things I've seen it do for teams. 
the other thing is these senior stakeholders that bring them to the boundary somehow, either directly engaging them or by representing their needs and what's valuable to them in the decision-making criteria. And when you've done that, you can help the team step up. So now these features are under control and you understand things about, about this value. The team can start to challenge. They can start saying, well, you've asked for this feature, but what's the real problem? What's the real opportunity here? What other options are there? That's where you get into things like partnership. And I, I did coaching of a really large 100-person program that was doing business transformation across 10 businesses. And I did a review afterwards to see uh, you know, what worked, what hadn't worked with all the, the coaching we'd done. And the head of product said to me, the, the single best thing we'd, we'd done was in the process there was a step that said, um, you must have considered at least three options. And she said things would come in and so we'd think of another two and they wouldn't be as good and, you know, la la la. But then she said every so often it really forced us to think and we did, we came up with something that was much better, much simpler, uh, much you know, cheaper to do or, or a more elegant solution. Um, and it just forced some creative thinking. Uh, but this is a little bit of a higher maturity thing to aim for. So there's another boundary, which is to you, to management, and as I said before, if a team is raising impediments, then fix them, fix them fast, and then you're seen as supportive management and they can do their job. So managing the boundary might look a bit like this. It's the team, the impediments and other requests are being come to you for direct support, and typically the scrum master is trying to manage that. So the stakeholders, the product owners trying to manage that, there should be one backlog, and it can be really useful to have these prioritization criteria when you've got multiple stakeholders and potentially a senior stakeholder involved. Um, I think when this is done well, this, is, this has got a real feeling of control around it, if it was professional, well managed, if it was controlled. But you do have to stand your ground sometimes to, to make this the way that things are, and that again is a leadership management thing. To, you know, to stand up for what you know is right and what is really going to support the team in having a, a solid boundary. So as our final thing, now we've looked outside, and we've looked at the boundary, we'll look inside the team because it's great, we understand all the stakeholders and the business value and the context, we're managing our boundary solidly, but if inside it, you know, it, it's just flat and unmotivating, that team isn't going to be high performing. So what can happen inside the team? It can be things like, I disagree, but I, I can't talk about it. I better keep quiet. Uh, it could be, oh, I've got a concern, oh, oh, but I won't mention it. Someone must have dealt with that. It could be, we're just flat. We're no better than last year, just plodding along. It can be, well, I've got this great thing we could do, but, oh, but no one else will try it. And in the end, it's just demotivating. And people just, you know, clocking in, they're bored, they're probably moving on to other teams and trying to find better jobs. I find there's five things that really help with the inside of a team. It's the team vision. that's going to make us go a little bit towards that vision of a great team. And when I say experiment, I don't mean trying things at random. I mean, well, here's the thing we want to improve. Let's try doing this new practice or this new behavior, and we're going to do it for a certain amount of time, say a few weeks or a month, and then we're going to review it and we'll see, did it make things better? Do we want to carry on or do we want to stop? And it's got a real formal structure to it. So help the team you know, establish this sense of a more formal experimentation and, and how they'll know it's a success or not. On the, the, particularly on the softer side, um, valuing the differences between team members can be really effective because it's not, people will know different technical skills, 
but they have other things. They can be good at drawing. They could be good at simplifying ideas. They could be good at thinking of problems. They could be good at thinking of really unusual ideas. They could be good at arbitrating disputes and you know, helping people get along. So if you can surface that so everyone in the team knows where the strengths are, other people in the team can start to use them. And finally, there's just standard kind of communication and conflict resolution skills. And there's lots of great external training and coaching for this, and that's a good one to get coaching for. Um, I do things with teams that cover all of this, because I usually find building a vision means the team have to communicate, and they will create have conflicts between them. So you can kind of use the whole thing to take them through a process of developing the skills and getting to the vision. That's really interesting to do. So if you're doing this well, and the success modes will be things like someone might say, oh, I think the way you're implementing the caching is going to cause problems. And the response is, oh, I'd like to hear what you think. Let's work on it together. It, it kind of comes from a place of, I don't think you're criticizing me. I think you've got my best interests and the team interests at heart. So, so what can you teach me? What can I learn here? It's a very different kind of mindset when people can collaborate like that and speak up like that. You might have things like, oh, I need this module to be reliable, particularly reliable. And they know that someone else is very good at thinking of problems. So they, they seek out that. And particularly people like QA people are great at knowing how to break things and thinking of problems. You might have, well, what is the experiment? Yeah, this month we're trying pair programming or whatever it is. Can I tell you what it is that is the experiment? And we're looking at what other teams are doing, other teams in the organization, outside the organization. What is, what's good practice that might work here that we could try? And a kind of proactive, you know, if there's issues, I'm raising it to the team or I'm going to do something about it because I feel I can. And this is the kind of things you might hear or be, you know, or look for. It, to know that the team is being really successful inside. And, and the feelings here, there's a lot of trust, there's a lot of camaraderie, there's excitement, and there's motivation in this kind of team. So just to quickly summarize everything we've been talking about, I think the successful Agile Managers checklist. We're doing these organizational things to set up the real team in the first place reward teams as a whole, make sure they've got resources, solve problems that are outside their influence and do it fast so that they feel supported. Then there's this coaching the team rather than managing individuals. And we can look at the inside, the outside and the boundary to do that. Outside, help them to get the full context, to have an engaging, meaningful direction. Don't be afraid to set direction. Help them to make valuable commitments. It could mean you're working with a product owner, because arguably some of this is their responsibility. But don't leave it to them. You know, look, look to see if you think it's happening well and, and give them you know, your, your perspective from a bigger, more strategic point of view. At the boundary, help keep that boundary really firm, particularly if the stakeholders get difficult. Having clear decision-making criteria can be very helpful here. And watch out for those senior stakeholders who may be a bit too distant and find ways to bring them in, either directly or represented through decision-making criteria. And once you're doing that well, help the team to start stepping up the value they add by challenging the feature requests and start looking at what business value is and how they deliver that. Finally, at the inside, help teams to aspire to an ambitious vision of what that team could really be, to, to use experimentation well, to value the individual differences and, and strengths of different team members and utilize those and make sure that the communication and conflict resolution skills are strong inside the team. And if you look in these areas and start to do these things, I called this a successful manager's checklist, but you won't be seen as a manager anymore. What you'll be seen as is a supportive and inspiring leader of teams. And I've experienced how fantastic a high performing team can be, and I've been in them, and I believe we can create far more of them. They're good for business, and they're good for the people in them. I spent a lot of my career coaching teams like this, and uh, if you want to do the same, I'd really love to help you. If you want to talk to me, anything you'd you know, like to know, or you've got any feedback on the presentation, uh, that's my email address at the top. If you'd like to find out a bit more about my company, there's the web address. I, I've 
pointed you initially to the blog because there's articles I've got there about some of these things like business value and um, you can drop me your email address and I'll let you know about new articles and if I'm doing other webinars like this. And really that's the, the presentation, so I'd love to hear if there's any questions that I can answer. So uh, we've got a couple of questions come in here. Um, so we've got a nice one here. So how can you do the forecast for a new team or work when one has not done something similar in the past? Uh, which is from, uh, excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, uh, Gatton Chowdhury. Uh, there's probably a whole talk in this topic. I think the really simple answer is um, it's to, you can do some high level estimation, just standard things, just don't spend a lot of time on it. The, the key that Agile gives you is to get started. So do a sprint uh, on something meaningful, just try and get like one thing, just one tiny, tiny feature or something done and ship it and then try and get another one done and capture the data. So how many, how much stuff, you know, whether it's features, story points, whatever your units are, how much stuff did you manage to get done in sprint one, how many in sprint two, how many in sprint three. And once you're through a few sprints, um, ideally that starts to stabilize. So at that point, you're now not, in a sense, not doing new work, it's not really a new team. You're understanding what has to happen with that team in that context with those stakeholders. Uh, and basically now you can forecast and you're forecasting from actual data because you get the actual data from each sprint. But I would say be really careful because if you don't ship, it's not actual data because you haven't gone through the release processes and, and that can fool a lot of teams. Um, so hopefully that that helps. I, I've got a whole talk on this because I can show you the graph of like my team's velocity data over a year and you know, how we predicted when the project was going to end and that's very interesting. Um, so the, oh, so Paul Henman's asked about um, the cone of uncertainty, oops, sorry, uh, that's a really interesting one. Um, someone went back to look at the original sources for the cone of uncertainty um, that Barry, I think it's Barry Bone published and discovered that it isn't actually based on any data whatsoever. Um, so it's kind of, it's an illusion, it doesn't, it doesn't exist, except that um, Steve McConnell, who's a really well-known development guy, has gone and gathered the data. And what he found for real customers is there is kind of a cone, but it's um, it's got some interesting shapes, so it actually looks more like a bullet, which is, um, it just stays really, really, really uncertain until very near the end of the project, uh, and then it collapses. But some teams can manage it, which I think is really what I've been saying about start gathering actual data about the actual situations, and then they make it look a bit more like a cone. I, I, I wish I could show you pictures, because it makes a lot more sense, uh, but it's always completely skewed. Um, in the sense that uh, everyone is too optimistic uh, and the projects, almost even for the people who manage it really well, uh, they're too optimistic at the start. He says by collecting the data across multiple projects, you can get a sense of how optimistic your organization is, so then you can correct for it. So you can say, well, projects tend to be optimistic by 20%, so we'll just you know, put the 20% on, and there we go. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting area. Um, I, uh, I might be able to find some information on it if you care to drop me an email with your email address. I'll see if I can dig out a paper on it with some nice pictures. Um, so the so Gatan said um, the stakeholder question will remain open. When can I get this in the beginning? With a little smiley. Uh, actually, I'm not quite sure what that means. Is that the who are the stakeholders or the, the stakeholders questioning when it will be done? 
Uh, maybe if you let me know a little bit more about what you'd like to know on that one, I'll see what I can do. Uh, let's see, Michael Clark says, um, does documentary production governance get in the way of successful Agile teams? Um, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Is that um, the, is that a, like a, You think what we're producing is software, when actually what they're producing is a product that may consist of a package of things, which might be, let's say, software and documentation. So they may go, well, what we actually have to ship is the software and a manual and uh, a run book for the support team and you know, release notes for maybe audit purposes and you know, three or four things. If the team if you set that as being that's what you ship and the mindset is it's not just the software, teams can do, your yeah, agile teams usually have a definition of done, in other words how they know a piece of work is complete, so on that you might expect to see have you updated the run book, have you updated the training, have you updated the, um, you know, the release notes, hopefully that's done by a tool. Then, so now that, if you think about this, well what's the direction? It, you know, it's actually setting, it's the, to do this outside, they've got the context, they know what they're supposed to be delivering, so now they ship it and you can check the quality, you know, do people read the manual, does it work for them, can the support team actually work with a run book, so you get that feedback. And in terms of doing this forecasting, because you're always doing all the tasks, you're always keeping the training up to date and the support documentation up to date, then your forecast can be more accurate because you don't have a sudden unknown job, you know, in six months' time where it's like, right, the training materials and no one's ever done it, so they don't know what's involved. Uh, and there's a few subtleties to doing that, but I think that that's the key um, for me to working with teams that need to produce documents, uh, unless there's a different kind of document you were thinking of that that didn't cover. <laughs> Uh, so what else have we got? Um, let's see, there's a question here about uh, the techniques for working with um, business value and stakeholder value. Um, yeah, that, that's one I do a lot. Um, there's an interesting little tale. Uh, people tend to give you, if you ask them what they do, tend to give you something that's um, like, well, I'm writing a system, or uh, I met someone recently and they said they, their job was a global head of security, and then what I said to them a bit later was, well, actually, your job is protecting 28 billion of revenues, because that's the business value that, that that person has, and he, he rather liked that, thought it was an upgrade to his job title. Um, with the business value, you can usually think of as making money, protecting money, reducing costs, and avoiding costs, uh, and you can put financial value, and that's really helpful at portfolio level for making portfolio decisions. It's usually too far away, it's useful for the team to know that, but they usually can't affect it directly. So you then look at the stakeholder value, which is how, how the stakeholders are getting that. So for example, I was coaching a big project business transformation project, the ultimate financial goal was reduce the costs of you know, tens of millions. But fundamentally, the way they were doing that was there was a task to publish data, which all the businesses were doing. It took an awful lot of people. By reducing the time and effort it takes to do that task, then they can reduce the people, which gives you the cost saving. So actually, the stakeholder value is all in the time of the task. And the time of the task is something everyone in the team can get behind. They can understand the tasks, they can understand how long they take, they can understand that you know, delivery makes it quicker. So, so if you can, can get a handle on 
these kind of directly influenceable um, uh, sort of valuable qualities of the business, like the time to do a task, and then people, that's effectively this you know, multi-hundred person program, multi-millions of budget can be boiled down to one piece of paper with three things like that on it, which is how they're making the business better. And then the, the kind of focus and direction the team can have when it, you've made something that complicated and something that simple is, is quite remarkable. Um, I, I've got some things on my blog about that if you want to find out more. Um, and I think uh, someone's very kindly said they enjoyed the presentation. That's very nice. Thank you, Marcus. And then I think the only other one was uh, a little bit more about team vision. Um, so for me, there's a few qualities. Part of it is practical, so some aspirational qualities. So my team's always had uh, an aspiration to, to have no bugs getting out of development. So if any bug got into it, even UAT, there was tutting and gnashing of teeth amongst the developers. And they knew it. unit tests for code or doing continuous integration. So can we work towards that? Can we do continuous delivery? That's quite ambitious. And you can make your way towards that in a number of steps. So it's an aspiration. I think that that's the practical side. And I think there, there can be a softer side as well about you know, what kind of team would I like to be in? You know, what, what's, um, what kind of supports me well? Uh, and, and you can do some really interesting team exercises uh, with what makes a good team for each individual, which of course then has the potential to uh, help people communicate because they need to ask each other about them. So a uh, very interesting topic. Okay, I think, I think that's, uh, that's it. Oh, uh, thank you very much from Sean for saying good stuff and Max for saying thanks for the presentation. I can't see any other questions, so uh, Irene, do you want to conclude? Yeah, um, that uh, concludes the question and answer session. Uh, we would like to thank you, Paul, for you know your brilliant presentation, and uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, we will make the recording available afterwards, and we'll send you the link. And uh, we look forward to your future particip participation at our events. Again, um, we have an event next week, uh, Agile Programming Project Management Conference.